Okay. I think I will get uh, started. So thank you very much for, for joining on this uh, tech talk. I really appreciate it. Um, there's a couple of topics we want to discuss today. So uh, thank you for, for joining. I, I think we will be done in 35 to 40 minutes and then we'll have some time for questions. Uh, so if you do have a question, I think your microphone is muted. I, I can enable it if you want, but um, I would prefer if you uh, phrase your questions in the Q&A uh, folder inside this meeting. I will look at the Q&A and, and see if there's only any open questions in the during the meeting, but um, we will have time for that afterwards. All right, so in this, um, uh, throughout this uh, tech talk, I want to talk about our range of competences first. Then I will dive a little deeper on our electric drive core, which consists of the actuator, the mechanics, the electric power drive, the TOX power module core, and our TOX software. I want to finish this with um, the biggest portion of the meeting, uh, some examples for the automotive drivetrain and uh, some challenges and solutions to that. All right, then let's get started and I hope you enjoy the, this, this meeting. Tox Presentation is a global company with its headquarters worldwide in the southern part of Germany. That's where we have been founded more than 45 years ago and throughout the decades we have spread out uh, around the world. In the USA we are located uh, or headquartered in the suburb of Chicago, which is where I am based off as well. We have other representations throughout the USA as well. So feel free to, to reach out to us through, through our homepage or through my contact. In terms of the competences, Tox has developed uh, or has the capability to consult you uh, with the optimal solution and uh, finds the best product for your uh, request. Furthermore, Tox can uh, support you in comparing hydraulic versus air over oil versus electric servo press solutions. We have in-house development uh, for more than 45 years and are very proud of increasing our R&D department year over year. In the second stage of uh, a project cycle, we help you plan. We can recommend the best fit in terms of our servo press uh, portfolio, a roller spindle versus a ball screw. We, can, we do have dimensioning centers throughout the world, just like we do as well in the US, which means we can have your parts tested in our house to see what the force over distance curve looks like. We can also check your design, check accessibility and feasibility and uh, get an engagement on uh, engineering level to see what, uh, how your problem can be solved. Once you place an order with us, we do have a production or assembly in-house uh, throughout the world. We do have multi-point calibration of the force sensor and we match each equipment, so the controller with the actuator in-house and uh, test it as well. After the, uh, the shipping, uh, we do support you with uh, ser service worldwide. So it doesn't matter where your machine will sit. We probably have a service person uh, very close by. We can support you with commissioning as well as maintenance, repair, trainings, either in-house or on-site. It's all possible. Okay, then let me continue with our uh, TOX portfolio. So TOX consists of uh, several components. I'm sure most of you are familiar also with our air over oil cylinders, which you can see on the top left. So this is really what our founder has created and invented uh, more than 45 years ago and is creating press force from, from day one. Um, Decades ago, we already started with uh, experience and research on joining technologies. So whenever it comes to joining different types of sheet metals uh, through a clinching process or a riveting process, uh, Tox is your contact partner. So more than 20 years ago, we started developing our servo press, also called electromechanical press module. We call this in our latest generation, the Tox electric drive core. Out of those components you can see on the left side, we do create uh, some turnkey systems. So there's a tabletop 
uh, press, which we call the FlexPress Compact. Uh, press systems in standard uh, portfolio or also special um, solutions in terms of uh, sizes as well as a control we are capable to do in-house as well. And on the bottom right, you can see multi-technology platforms that we have uh, developed. Those find their, um, uh, their place in market mostly in the body and white infrastructure in the automotive sector. Finishing this first chapter, I want to look at the branches. So on the left, you can see we are mostly present, re represented in the automotive industry, but also in the, any other industrial applications can use our uh, products, as well as medical, electrical, white goods, food, and so on. Standard applications, I'm sure uh, you as a customer uh, are more familiar with that uh, even than us, but um, your application can find uh, a press in our house. So that can be a joining procedure like press fitting and installing, um, like we can see in bearings or bushings, uh, motor or gear installation, pressing and compressing. So this can be a fuel cell stack, a battery stack, but it can also be in the food industry when you press down pizza dough to become a, a frozen pizza. Sheet metal connection, of course, sheet metal transformation, as well as component handling, testing, and so on, uh, can be used, uh, can be a, a regular use case for our servo press. At the end, anything that requires press force, you can think about TOX and you can think about the servo press. If you or your customer is not yet, uh, where TOX is not yet specified on its approval list, just reach out to us. I'm sure we will uh, be very competitive in benchmarks and we will give you an advantage for your application. Right, now I want to wrap up the first chapter and jump directly into the second one where I will discuss our servo press. So in terms of an overview here, a quick video I want to share. All right. Inside this video, you can see our actuator, the electric power drive, the controller, the power module core, and our software here displayed on an HMI pen. Those three work together and it is what uh, uh, part of our new uh, product. The controller sits somewhere in the enclosure. Of course, it drives the servo motor, but it also evaluates the sensor data coming from the edge unit. So there we can extend sensors to your needs. The software at the end can be used to visualize the, the cycle. So here optimized on a touch screen, uh, you can see this is very intuitive, um, designed for, for modern applications, sort of what we are used to from smartphone handling and, and tablet handling. We collect up to 10,000 data points per cycle, and this is what you can display on the software. At the end, this is state of the art in terms of communication and establishment and uh, field bus as well. Moving on, we are looking at the scope of delivery or also our system overview. The left-hand side, you can see the actuator consisting of the servo motor mainly, the uh, gearbox, and then the belt that drives the spindle. Our actuator, also contains two sensors, a reference sensor and an integrated force sensor. And those now communicate directly with the edge unit. So you have very short length of uh, cable, which is uh, always an advantage when you look at analog signals. The edge unit then um, is our decentralized intelligence and the edge unit prepares our signal to be able to communicate it back with our controller. So we communicate the, the sensor signals via the system, back, system bus back to the controller. Also, you do have the option to extend your sensor environment by additional uh, external sensors. You are very free in what kind of sensor that is. So normally we're looking at external load cell or position sensors, but this can also be a pressure or temperature sensor. In the center or in the core of this application, you can see our power module core, which is really at the end, our controller that 
drives the motor, but also evaluates the feedback loop, the position signal, as well as the sensor signal. All of this is being performed in our application. And this is really where our key uh, intelligence has moved into. So all of our pressing know-how, everything that we have established, all of our experience throughout the past years, decades, has been um, uh, moved and standardized into one application code that you as a customer can now uh, use. The application code, of course, contains all the parameters of the motor, the spindle, calibration factors, but it also contains the process instruction set, what is the target uh, position, target speed, and so on. And it also performs all the monitoring actions that you can define. So every process can be monitored by different means, as well as uh, by uh, uh, windows, I will later describe. You as a customer want to integrate this power module core with your system or with your PLC, and you can do so with a very flexible field bus. So it doesn't matter what kind of uh, communication you would like to have or what data you would like to transmit, this can be done over our flexible field bus. To finish this image, you can use our TOX software. So the TOX software is free of charge and it's part of our delivery scope, and you can really install it on any computer you may have. Once you run the software, you do have the uh, ability to visualize the, the data from coming from the uh, power module core. So visualize the curve, but you also have the opportunity to use it to store all the quality data in the data format that you want. So if you want the quality, the full press curve data for traceability reasons, you can store so in the data format that you select yourself. You can store it either on its own hard drive, if you have it on a software on a computer somewhere, or communicate with the cloud or with the server that's connected to it. If you do use the software as a middleware, you can connect or you can um, uh, display multiple curves, multiple actuators using one instance of the software. Coming to the process monitoring, we do rely on window technology for, for monitoring, and that's really a state of the art or really setting the bar in terms of process monitoring. Within windows, you can do multiple things. You can watch for average and extremes. You can also implement math functions, calculation functions, and you can have up to five windows per process. If that's not enough, just let us know. I'm sure we have a solution for more as well. Describing all the different windows would be too much for, for this meeting. Uh, so I just want to highlight a couple uh, of them. The bottom left, you can see must cross. So you define a window in the force over position area, and you define the window to must be crossed by the curve. If not, you get another okay part. You can also detect the slope. So you can detect sort of a yield point. When does my slope change uh, or hit a threshold that you define yourself? Lastly, on the right, you can see an integral. You can calculate how much, um, uh, what the, uh, or add the positions, the, the forces over several positions, add them together, which results in the uh, result in, in the total energy you have applied into the component, into the system. So you can set thresholds. The energy has to be within the min and a maximum level for the parts to result in okay. I just want to highlight you the software. Here you can see a screenshot of it and a fully customized dashboard. So a very typical curve we are looking at here. Software is free of cost. It's very flexible and network-based for quality data. You can have multiple authorization levels for user management, and you can adjust it to your requirements. So you can adjust the way it looks uh, to, to, to you, what you want to uh, see. It's multilingual as well, and it's de designed and developed in house of talks. We do support multi-channel, which means two channels, up to two channels in our standard, but more is also possible. Just reach out to us. Per channel, we can have up to 10 tracks and we can have up to 5,000 diagram points per channel. So those are the diagram point is normally a force position and timestamp um, per, uh, per, per channel. 
All right. Quickly going over our uh, versions, electric drive versions. On the left, you can see the EQEK, which is our ball screw spindle. And it is mainly our, uh, on the lower end of the force range. So it starts at two kilonewton, which can push as low as 10 newton even. And it ends at a maximum of 100 kilonewton. Our superior in terms of performance is the EXEK product. So it's uh, somewhat comparable in, in terms of uh, force range as well, but we do range up to 200 kN. It's especially uh, more lightweight and smaller in dimensions, and it is uh, the better performing product in terms of force accuracy as well as spindle uh, life expectancy. Also throughout the years, we have established many different variants uh, ready in the drawer for, for your order or um, even uh, fully on stock uh, if, if you want to uh, have one of those. Those are the F variant for ultra fast applications up to 800 millimeters per second, the R for robot tongues, so ultra lightweight, and the L which goes up to 1000 kilonewton. That's not enough. We can also put two 1000 kilonewton drives next to each other and achieve two 2000 kilonewton or also 200 tons. There's further special variants, like special lengths above one meter of stroke, extra narrow solutions, extra short solutions, as well as uh, special protection types like IP65 or clean room. Okay. We quickly see if there's been any question. None, none at the moment as far as I can see. All right. We have now covered the first two topics and moving into the third one. Before I do this, I just want to show you a couple of pictures. Here you can see our controllers, which are really reduced in size as well and uh, save space in your uh, enclosure. Here you can see a typical application where robots feed in an industrial environment, robots feed the components, and we have a fully automated uh, system. Those are just a couple of options. Feel free to reach out if you want to uh, get an UDI screen from us, an external sensor maintenance equipment, a brake or mechanical attachment as well. Okay. I think now comes the, the fun part, and I want to show you a quick example and spend most of the time of this meeting, so roughly 20 minutes now, uh, in, on this and the next two slides. Just so we are on the same page in terminology, I will use a, a shaft, a bearing, a sprocket, and uh, perhaps at the end, a plastic ring. Before I get forget, uh, typical applications for these are uh, electric motors, uh, differentials, gearboxes, wheel bearings, drive shafts, and so on. There's many applications in the automotive drivetrain where you need press force to push something in. These uh, are similar as well out in the industrial world. So whenever you are getting out of the electric uh, vehicle or out of the uh, automotive world. Okay, I want to use my pen here and showcase an uh, example. So let me draw here just a simple sketch. And let's say this is my bearing with a hole inside of it. This goes all the way through, maybe up to here to the bottom of this part. There's a hole in this bearing. This is a rectangular bearing. It uh, would be very strange to see this in, in, um, in the real world but my drawing abilities are not that good. <laughs> All right. And then what I want to push in to this bearing is a shaft. So this is my shaft. And I want to push this in in the first step into the bearing. Of course, I will be using a servo press and apply force moving down. This is just a sketch of the servo press, and then I'm applying force while I'm moving down. OK, 
Okay, looking at the force over distance curve or over position, uh, we can tell that the force will be roughly around zero while the ram is moving freely and not hitting anything. Then at one point, we are hitting the shaft and we are pressing it in. So the force will likely go up quite, quite steep uh, as we first have, have the first contact. And then it may drop a little. And while we are pressing in, it may be quite constant, maybe moving up a little bit. And then let's say at the, at the bottom of this bearing, there's really a, a tool or something preventing from, from my shaft to be over, over pressed. So I want a flush um, alignment at the bottom here. So if I continue pressing, this may go up the force, but at one point, if I just continue pressing, I will just hit the tool and I cannot really make any more distance. I will just uh, increase more and more force into the system. And I may as well flex the frame and just bend everything I have open if I continue pressing. Okay, so let me change the color here. Let's say this is my point X1. And below here is my point X2. So X1 is, of course, when my force starts first to increase. And X2 is sort of the final position. What I can do now is add some windows for monitoring. Or maybe I want to detect where is point X1 with the first window I add here. And then I want to detect where do I finish my cycle, or in other terms, where do I just bend open my frame and do not generate any more um, uh, force into the system. I do not press it, uh, the shaft further into the bearing. In order to do so, I have these two uh, windows here, and I want to now look at the slope of this curve. So if I add another axis here, let's say here the slope is at zero, and here it is negative and here it is positive. I'll go back to red and I draw in the slope. Of course, the slope is around zero as long as not, there's nothing uh, happening in terms of the, the, the slope of my curve. Once I my force increases up, you can see the slope here. It's very steep, it's very high as I'm moving up in force over position. So my slope, also my first derivative, of uh, force over position will be very high. At this point, it is going back to zero and then it's going even negative. So I do have a negative slope here. Uh, it's going back to zero and then negative. And at this point, my slope is uh, almost zero. And then it's going a little bit positive here, increasing a little bit. And at this point, the slope will just jump up to uh, close to infinite if it's uh, going up this much. So inside my window one, I could watch what does my slope do? Does my slope exceed a trigger point that I define here? Let's say y, y1. If yes, I want to define this as my yield point. This is my slope detection. So I can define where is point x1. In the second window, I can also watch, I set maybe a higher trigger level, maybe here, Y2, and see where does my slope hit or exceed this trigger level. And then I will find my second um, a point, my final position. I could define as when you find this position, stop pressing. You're just bending the frame. You're not making any distance good anymore. Just stop pressing whenever window two finds this slope ex uh, accession. So you won't even press this high. Okay. One other thing I can do is I could now check, okay, this distance from point X1 to point X2 is really just the height of my bearing. And I can confirm, is this height within the specs that I want to have? So I could have a definition here, x2 minus x1 should be in between predefined threshold of min and max value. 
And therefore we monitor the quality of the bearing, whether this height is okay or not. Okay. Another thing is uh, maybe you want to use the same press once the shaft is pressed in to now push a sprocket on there. So again, my drawing skills may not be perfect, but that's why I have the image there. You want to use the sprocket and press it onto the uh, shaft now. And maybe you don't want to press it all the way until it's flush with the bearing. You just want to press it a distance up till here. Let's call this distance D1. So what I can do is I can start pressing. Of course, my force will be zero as long as I'm not hitting anything. And then depending on the shaft height and, and the sprocket height, at one point, I will start seeing a force increase. I'm now overwriting this, the same plot um, with a different curve. So this will be a different process as well. So the force will increase once I'm hitting the shaft. Maybe not as high as before, but it will um, continue having a, a force increase until I hit this position. Maybe it will go down and then it will continue having a force increase. What I can do now is also here, same way having window number three defined. And in window three, I want to detect this position. So let's, let's call this just uh, X3. And I want to say, okay, whenever you hit the shaft, whenever you have the first contact point, it doesn't matter how long the shaft is, I want to have an exact distance of D1 pressed in. So relative to this position, I have an exact distance of D1. So you want to press in X3 plus D1 should be the final position. We can also do so. So we can also take this point, detect it using the same uh, slope function and press in until we get maybe here x3 plus d1, this new uh, position for this proc. There's many other functions we could do potentially with um, with windows. We could monitor the slope for further extent. We could monitor the, the shaft on its quality, like how, how round is it? Is, is there something uneven on it? Uh, if there's lubrication um, um, also used, we can monitor how well is the lubrication. Maybe it's um, decreasing in lubrication. And many parts are machined somewhere with a tool. So maybe that tool, that drill has wear and tear. At some points, it's uh, uh, one thousandth of a millimeter bigger than at um, uh, when the wear and tear is uh, going down. All this can be monitored, but it would just be too much for this meeting to cover all that. The last one uh, is the, the plastic ring. And I don't want to draw in another curve. Um, maybe, maybe dark blue. So this plastic ring, let's say the, the, the sprocket is already on the shaft. And now you want to press in this plastic ring using the same press. So in one step, maybe even with the same tool, if you have a really smart tooling system, you press in the shaft, go back up, pressing the bearing, go back uh, press in the sprocket, go back up, and then press in the, the plastic ring using just one servo press. The problem you may see is this guy here is, let's say, at uh, 55 kilonewton. This guy here is maybe at 35 kilonewton or, or 40 kilonewton. Maybe that plastic ring just requires something like this one kilonewton. Can you use the same press to just press in such low of a force? How do we do this? Because our press have a force sensor accuracy of 1% or maybe 0.5%. So if that's a 60 kilonewton press, it will have six plus minus 600 newton 
or plus minus 300 newton, depending on the model. If you hit it, uh, we want to hit one kilonewton and you're plus minus 300 newton, plus minus 600 newton, that may not be accurate enough. So you want high accuracy. I want to show you how to do this. So using our servo press, we can implement an external load cell with very high accuracy. So we have different load cells. They can be calibrated to a different range. It depends on whether you want to change it with the tool or with the component or it's always mounted. But we do have 0.1% uh, force accuracy up to 1% force accuracy on external cells. They can be mounted anywhere, really, um, either here on the drive ram uh, if there's your component here, it can be mounted underneath the component or uh, on the tool you may have. So there's multiple uh, positions you can mount this external load cell. You can switch between the integrated and the external force channel during the process at a defined position or force or from a signal uh, coming from the PLC. Looking at such a plot, we can see the uh, two curves uh, on this plot. The blue one is the integrated force sensor and the green one, the external one. Curve record can be initiated whenever you want it, as well as ended whenever you want it. And the sensor sample rate on the sensor, on, on the, the, the channel, can be adjusted to your needs as well. So on the internal one, on the blue one, you can see the uh, it has a low force, which is mainly caused by the uh, guide rail and the weight of the tool. The external one is around zero until we hit the component, since it is in this scenario mounted underneath the component. Once you hit the component, you can switch to the external load cell for higher accuracy. And you can also have an additional comparison of the integrated and the external uh, load cell, just to make sure your system still works the way you want it to work. Right. Lastly, I want to show you another example. Um, applications for this is hydrogen fuel cell stacks. Also hydrogen electrolyzers have similar processes and also uh, layered battery stacks. So whenever a battery doesn't contain round cells, but layered battery stacks, you may require holding force or holding position. Okay, and then uh, to in order to hold force or hold position, let me take white here. You do have, of course, a servo press somewhere in the system with the ram, and you're driving down force. In order for the, this process to work well, you have three requirements, three main requirements. First, very often you need very high stroke lengths. Stroke length above one meter. Why is that? I've seen many uh, prototyping applications where you, um, you are not sure yet what final amount of fuel cell height you may want and you want to be flexible to change to other fuel cell heights. Second requirement is snow power speed. So whenever we are pressing uh, or hitting the, the target, we, want, we may want to have very slow power speed, like below 0.1 millimeters per second, just to be able to have the, the chemicals in, inside this, this stack uh, work and perform the action that, that you wanted. You don't want to press too, too fast. If you ask me, uh, fuel cell or hydrogen is, is sort of like a bomb. I'm not a chemist, but uh, I understand why you want to have very slow uh, pressing speeds. Sometimes you also want to press towards a target one, hold it there a couple of seconds or, or minutes, and then press to the second target, hold it there a couple of minutes, and then to the final um, 
final uh, force. The third requirement is very long holding periods. So in order to hold, you normally want to hold position is what I've seen. You can drive down to a target uh, force, target position, and then you can engage a brake to hold that position. So we do have here the option of adding a motor holding brake directly on the motor or a safety brake on the spindle. And both brakes block, mechanically block um, the, the component from doing any further revolutions. When you engage the brake, of course, you can hold the position. And we have a very good experience out in the field with engaging the motor holding brake in order to hold the force. You can do so for multiple hours, days. It doesn't matter how long you want to hold the force. The main advantage is you may have an operator going in here and performing some tasks while the fuel cell stack is under load or under force, and you don't want the motor to engage in that uh, time. So that's a safety uh, concern you may want to engage the motor holding brake for. Also, additionally, of course, while you engage the motor holding brake, you don't consume any energy. So it may be an energy concern, a concern as well. All right, but I want to still populate the graphs on the right. So let's look at the force over time now. So this is a curve that has the force on the y-axis and the time on the x-axis. In the beginning, it will be, the, the press will be moving freely and there will be no force, oh, no force at all uh, on, on the ram. Then you will increase force, maybe slowly. And then you may hold the force. Let's look at the position in the same plot in the same diagram. So if I look at position over time, position may go up rapidly. I'm sorry. May go up rapidly until we hit the target. And then because I have a fast approach speed, and then maybe the position still increases a little bit very slowly. So here, I have a uh, high speed and here I have a low speed in this period. And then maybe you want to hold the position constant. And at the end, somewhere you drive down, maybe first slowly and then fast. So this period here can be, um, hours long. The force, of course, once you engage the brake, at this point you engage the brake. Engage. Brake. Looking at the force, this is a chemical um, that may be working while you're holding the position. So the press is not moving, it's not flexing at all, but maybe the force will fade a little bit. So also seen applications, maybe not in the fuel cell stack, but where the force will increase a little bit as well. So it can, it doesn't have to be constant until at the end you're releasing it and then it goes back down to zero. So that's another application which I've seen commonly in um, automotive drivetrain, as well as industrial appliances, where you have fuel cell stacks. To wrap this up, um, why would you choose TOX? We put you back in charge of your process. We have intuitive control over uh, your process definition. We are very flexible in terms of how you press to your target. We have excellent in-class quality and uh, 
pass and fail monitoring. And you can easily integrate our system into your environment. We're happy to help you on commissioning service as well. Uh, we do so free of charge if you're a first time customer and we can, um, we have best in class as well, um, uh, quality and traceability communications. So with this, I want to finish my presentation. I, let me see if there's any questions. I don't see anything in the Q&A open. So yeah, um, if you do have questions, feel free to reach out to me uh, via my contact details on the right. To all the participants, I thank you very much for joining. And I would like to see you again in one of our future webinars at our trade show in Chicago or in any other uh, format. Just let me know.